This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Tableau Software and Dole Food Company. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are tuning in from remote outposts over the Internet, and also listeners who are joining us on new radio affiliates in Washington, Florida, Maryland, and North Carolina. Thank you for being with us. In just a moment, Commissioner for the Federal Communications Commission, Ms. Mignon Clyburn, will be joining us to talk about how the FCC has acted to protect equal access to the Internet and about the future of AM and FM radio. But before Ms. Clyburn joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about her background. Mignon Clyburn received her degree from the University of South Carolina in Banking, Finance, and Economics. Her first career stop was journalism. She went to work in the family's publishing business in Charleston, where she rose to become the publisher and general manager of the Coastal Times. In 1998, Clyburn became a representative of the South Carolina Public Service Commission, where she served as chair between 2004 and 2000, uh, between 2002 and 2004. Following 11 years on the PSC, Clyburn was nominated in 2000 by President Obama to become a commissioner on the Federal Communications Commission. In 2013, she was asked to serve as acting chairperson of the FCC in the interim between the departure of Jenna Chowski and the confirmation of Tom Wheeler. Whereas others may have looked at the temporary appointment as an opportunity to lay low until the new chairperson took charge, Clyburn was determined to keep the FCC moving forward. She opened new blocks of the wireless spectrum, tackled technical issues between AT&T and small carriers, closed one of the largest telecom transactions in U.S. history, and overhauled regulations governing AM radio. Most recently, Clyburn has been an advocate for net neutrality, and we're going to hear more about the controversy surrounding access to the Internet later in today's program. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, Women's History Month honoree and FCC Commissioner, Ms. Mignon Clyburn. Welcome to the program, Commissioner. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to join you, Ms. Costa. Now, uh, not, a lot of us don't know what the FCC actually does, so I thought that maybe we could ease into the issue of net neutrality but by starting with what is the FCC actually responsible for? The FCC is an agency that was established by Congress in 1934 to, in essence, regulate the airwaves. Uh, if there's something that emits a signal through radio, your television, um, satellite, uh, cable, we have some type of authority over, uh, again, broadcast uh, medium. Uh, so the FCC is one of the most significant agencies that a lot of people have never heard of. A lot of people talk about us when it comes to controversy, say like a wardrobe malfunction on television, and um, they wonder what type of fine we may levy. But the scope and the significance of this agency is more than that. It is responsible for one-sixth of our nation's economy, which is basically the fundamental underpinning of the communications industry. Just think about it. There's nothing we can do, nothing you can do, um, in terms of business and personal life that does not require a, a communications underpinning. So the FCC is one of the most significant government agencies that a lot of people do not speak about until uh, sometimes if there's an incident that um, – um, warrant some some attention and and, in some cases some fines to be honest with you well you're absolutely right it's one of those agencies that just uh, keeps doing their job but is primarily in the background and now one of the charters of the FCC is to make certain the infrastructure and the pathways for communications by uh, cell phone computer radio television landlines are accessible to everyone and put to their highest use is that right it is absolutely correct. What we recognize and what Congress so aptly recognized is that markets are essential and that we should be supporters and enablers of innovation and investment. But markets are not perfect. And this is why you have an agency like the FCC, that it's a sort of a backstop, so to speak, of efficiencies uh, when it comes to provisioning of service, provisioning of opportunities, investments, and again, the, the lifeblood of uh, business and opportunities uh, and, and free speech uh, in this nation. So as you point out, 
Uh, and I, I think all of us can agree, it, it's impossible to function without the Internet these days. And, and as streaming content of very large users, uh, like a Netflix or a Hulu, for example, that it gets larger and it begins using up more and more Internet bandwidth, well, that leaves an increasingly narrow, narrower slice for the rest of us to use, which by definition means congestion and slower Internet service. So is that the problem the FCC was trying to head off with net neutrality? Well, it's, it's much, much broader than that. Mm -hmm. What we recognize is that this is an incredible platform that has been an enabler for opportunity and investment here and around the globe. But the open Internet is, uh, what, what this is, what broadband is, is a reflection of the free market at its best. It enables all of us, no matter where we are from, no matter what our abilities or capacity, no matter how rich or how poor. I like to see, say whether or not you uh, live off of Main Street or work on Wall Street, that you have an opportunity to create a business, to uh, share your points of view, to be a part of the American experience. And that is what we were attempting, are and will continue to preserve and highlight uh, with this order. So in order to be a part of the U.S. economy, you've got to have Internet access. Uh, how else could you do it? I, I agree uh, that um, you cannot function um, in, in our society. You cannot have access to some of the most basic services. If you go uh, to a few key states in this nation, even to apply for government assistance, you have to have an online connection. You, can, you, do, you cannot function in today's society without broadband, without connectivity. But the fact of the matter is, Ms. Costa, is that almost one-third of our citizens do not have broadband at home. And the reason why uh, this, the, the open Internet proceeding and our continued investment and providing opportunities for investment in broadband is so important is that we recognize that and we also recognize that there are markets where there are uh, gaps, uh, that there is not universal access, and this is why um, this is so important to enable us to continue to close those digital divides in this nation to ensure that every American has the opportunity to fully engage in the American experience and the American way of life and opportunities. So this explains why the FCC views the Internet as a, uh, as a public utility. It's, it's a necessary part of modern existence. Let's not pretend that it isn't. Uh, we've got health records going digital. We've got bank transactions going digital. You want to apply for a, to rent a house, you've got to fill out an application on the Internet. Um, um, this is the modern-day telephone. It is how we communicate today. Uh, you, did, you mentioned telephone, and I chuckle, because if you've got children or children in your life under a certain age, they do not use voice. Uh, they might have a, a, a phone, um, but they communicate with you in different ways. Um, you, 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 you might forget what their voices sound like. You know, they're going to text, they're going to forward, they're going to download. They're going to do all of these things that require connectivity. And this is why it's so important that this is an essential service. But I want to make clear what we did and did not do um, in February. What we did was say that your Internet access service, that retail broadband, we classified that as a telecommunication uh, service, not your online applications and the like. There is no regulatory engagement there. And this is what, you know, some of, uh, you know, in terms of the myths um, and, um, you know, some of the um, – incorrect information about exactly what we did. We did recognize what you said, though, that these are essential services, and access to that is clearly important. Now, I'm going to stop you there because we have to take our first break here. We're on a hard clock. But when we come back, I do want to ask you about some of the objections because, you know, based on what you and I have talked about, uh, what could possibly be the objection to giving everyone equal access to the Internet? But I know there were some, so we'll talk about that on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Thanks. Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. 
Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouthwatering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most important impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? Are things getting a little messy around the office? At Coast Paper and Supply, we'll meet all your janitorial needs. Mops, dusters, disinfectants, we got them. Can't get rid of that smell in the break room? Try our deodorizer. Carpet stains? We have a cure for that, too. While you're at it, pick up the essentials. Garbage cans and liners, sponges and brooms. Is your company going green? Coast Paper and Supply is offering earth-friendly cleaning and food service alternatives. Our ever-evolving stock includes compostable bowls, plates, cups, and cutlery. Not to mention eco-friendly cleaners and biodegradable trash can liners, all at the lowest possible price. So come visit Coast Paper and Supply at 151 Josephine Street or look us up at coastpapersupplyinc.com. You can also call us at 831-423-3350. That's 831-423-3350. Money can't make you happy, but the lack of it can sure add a lot of stress to your life. Need help with your personal finances? Listen Thursday nights at 7 p.m. to Money Moves. Host Pamela Fugit Hedrick offers one hour of free tips and tools to help you manage your cash flows with her Money Moves. Each Thursday night, she discusses topics like how to prevent a complete personal financial meltdown, how to start a go-to fund for emergencies, provide ideas on how to cut back rather than cutting out some of your expenses, how to erase your debt load and financial stressors, how to find funding for your retirement, how the heck do you enroll to use health insurance, no more excuses. Money Moves can answer these questions and so much more. Tune in Money Moves with your host, Pamela Fugit Hedrick, Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. to work on your Money Moves. Back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. And before the break, uh, you were making the point that uh, it's impossible to participate in the American economy today without using the Internet. But the FCC um, did meet quite a bit of resistance when it came to uh, net neutrality. And I, I believe you were just getting ready to talk about some of the myths and misinformation. Right. Uh, what we did, again, was make sure that the public recognizes uh, that their experience, just listening to you, you mentioned earlier that many of your listeners are online. We want to make sure that their experience is seamless, that no one, no provider is able to slow, you know, make slower or faster um, you know, their type of um, experience, that no individual or no company can 
prioritize or, or pay someone to have a faster or more robust experience than them, that if they are engaging in lawful conduct, that no one can, no company can block their experience. That so that this is the most incredible from my uh, point of view in my lifetime, especially my regulatory lifetime. Most incredible platform, most enabling platform uh, that exists. It is breaking down barriers. Um, it is ensuring that people with a good product or a good idea that they're able to put that out to the market and ensure that uh, uh, that no one else can get in the way of their uh, their possibilities. And so what we're doing here is further enabling that, um, that this platform um, is one that everyone, regardless of where they live, who they are, how much money they have, uh, can have access and opportunities. And this is why it was so important for us to craft some high-level rules to make sure that everybody's engagement and opportunities are equal online. Well, so let me talk a little bit about the objections because, you know, I like to give both sides of the argument yes. here on this program. And you've demonstrated throughout your career that you're an advocate of robust competition in the marketplace. Um, but you've also made it clear that if the market's not addressing the real consumer need, then targeted, very, very focused government actions may be needed. So, so let me ask you this. Why, why wouldn't competition amongst the service providers eventually resolve access, bandwidth, and speed issues? Because clearly, um, if that were working, then we, then we didn't, wouldn't need net neutrality. Well, one of the things that we have been seeing, especially lately in the mobile space, is there has been some accusations about preferential treatment, uh, that there have been individuals who said, when I am online, feels like things are slowed down. Mm -hmm. um, when I am online, it feels like, you know, my experience is less than robust. And what we have found in, a hand, in some cases, and we have um, had some judgments in this um, and have found um, cause in a couple of cases, that they were right, that their experience was impacted negatively uh, by a provider. So what we are doing in this particular case is saying no, no to the provider that they cannot block, they cannot slow down traffic, and they cannot be the gatekeepers um, for um, you know, access. They cannot limit competition. They can't um, uh, limit your ability to, um, to be the best that you can be online. They cannot uh, limit um, this experience for you. So um, you, what we are doing here is answering the call of about 4 million people who weighed into the FCC that said they want their experience to be equal. They want their experience to be robust. That they want a platform uh, that is reflective of the American experience and our ideals. That as freedom of the speech and expression and freedom to uh, for uh, more opportunities in, in this space. And this is what um, this platform uh, enables. And this is what, um, you know, these rules are, um, are set to, um, to uh, reinforce. Yeah, you know, I, this is not a exact parallel, but when people ask me why I am in favor of net neutrality, I tell them, well, how would you like it if when you turned on the lights in your house, sometimes you had electricity, sometimes you had a brownout, just a little bit of electricity, and sometimes you had a lot, depending on how much the biggest customer of the utility wanted to use at that particular moment. I mean, you wouldn't Absolutely. put you wouldn't put up with that for a moment if you didn't. You know, we we turn on the lights. We expect there to be power. We don't expect there to be sometimes power, no power, a little power. Now we wouldn't put up with that at all. And I don't believe we should put up with it with the internet or phone service or vital services. But there are some people that are wondering whether net neutrality might be the first step toward lifeline internet service, you know, similar to the lifeline telephone service. You, you mentioned that there's a number of people that do not have broadband access. Um, is part of the FCC's charter to get that access pushed out into those, those more remote areas so that everyone has access similar to the lifeline telephone program? So what we're doing is a number of things, and I'm glad you mentioned this. We have universal service programs. One in particular goes to the heart of the infrastructure uh, 
part, uh, side of the um, house in terms of investment uh, in those areas where the market will not necessarily go. Yeah. But what's happening? You know, people and companies will go are going to go to the places where they make the most money. Um, that is just you know standard uh, you know basic um, economics. But what we have seen and what we know is that when it comes to communications, when it comes to technology and opportunities, everyone in this nation should benefit. You should not be penalized for living in a low-density community. And so the FCC said, wait a minute, we're going to establish a universal service program that will make sure that a company will have an economic incentive to invest, to, build, to build, to enable an infrastructure that will allow you to be the best that you can be, that will allow your neighbor, your communities to reinvest in itself. Communities need this type of infrastructure. It is as important as water in roads. The, the communications and technology and the Internet um, is vital for the next series of steps in terms of our economic and professional evolution. And this is why it's so important that we are taking a very prominent role in ensuring that that investment occurs, particularly in areas where it will not. Now, the one thing you mentioned is the Lifeline program, and that is a program right now that's on the adoption side of the house. Because we could talk about all of the infrastructure and investment and all of that's important, but if people are not able to adopt if people are not able to sign on because of economic hardships, then we only have cured one side of the house. So we have a lifeline program that is targeted, that is means tested, that is looking at closing the information gap for those who are unable to afford right now basic phone service. But you and I talked about how we communicate today. And voice only is not enough. So what we are going to be talking about this summer um, with an item that will circulate, what we call an, a notice of proposed rulemaking that we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. is how we close that gap. Well, we're going to take another short break, but uh, stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Commissioner Mignon Clyburn to hear about lifeline types of services for the Internet and how important it is to leave no American behind. You're listening to the Costa Report. Have you checked out the Costa Report blog yet? Well, what are you waiting for? There's no quicker way to find out what newsmakers are saying than the Costa Report blog at RebeccaCosta.com. It's where the former CEO of Apple and PepsiCo, John Scully, predicts where the next tech breakthroughs are going to come from. And also where Trent Lott explains why a GOP reversal of the Senate nuclear option will signal real change in our nation's capital. And the Costa Report blog is where you'll discover why Alan Dershowitz is worried that ISIS is adopting Hamas-like tactics. You'll find all this and more at the Costa Report blog. A new blog is posted every week, and they're short, pithy, and tell the unvarnished truth. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com to get the latest blog. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And while you're there, be sure to register for updates and breaking news. The Costa Report blog, bringing you the news the big networks don't and won't. Did you know that May is National Get Caught Reading Month? Hello, I'm Rebecca Suze from the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Library. Please join us for our annual spring book sale this Saturday, May 16th from 11 to 4 p.m. at the Downtown Library. We have thousands of novels, children's books, media, and everything in between. Most are only $1 to $3. So join us this Saturday, May 16th, 11 to 4 p.m. at the downtown Santa Cruz Library parking lot. See you there. Hi, registered pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years. And what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. The symptoms of PCOS, which stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, are caused by the many cysts which produce lots of both male and female hormones. Excessive production of female hormones are associated with bad periods, sometimes no periods, bloating, weight gain, obesity, moodiness, sluggishness, while the excessive male hormones she produces can cause oily skin, acne, sometimes hair on the chest and back, thinning hair on the head. The hormone-secreting cysts are themselves associated with insulin and blood sugar, and most PCOS 
PCOS patients have oftentimes undiagnosed pre-diabetic signs. That means PCOS needs to be first treated as a sugar processing problem. And secondly, PCOS patients who usually have underlying digestive problems are going to want to look here too. PCOS patients should focus especially on fat malabsorption, gallbladder and liver health issues, as well as the health of the intestine. Vitamin C is helpful for all hormone health issues, and you want to make sure you're getting fatty vitamins too, especially vitamins E and A. Lecithin granules with fatty meals can support fat metabolism, and it wouldn't be a bad idea to finish off all meals with a little apple cider vinegar, which can stimulate the secretion of fat digestive enzymes from the pancreas. Probiotics can be helpful, as can supplemental bile salts and digestive enzymes. Think zinc important for balancing hormones, and selenium, which has a stabilizing effect on estrogen. Some women can get relief by using progesterone cream. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos too at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. Join me for It's a Question of Balance with Ruth Copland Saturday evening, 8 till 10. My in depth arts interview is with indie rap icon Merce, talking about his life, art, and new album, Have a Nice Life. And I go out and about for questions that matter to interview people on the street about this week's topic. Join me Saturday evening, 8 to 10, on AM 1080 or ksco.com live stream. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. And before the break, we were talking about the fact that in, in, in order for the entire country to remain informed, unified, and moving forward, uh, a voice connection's not enough. And uh, service providers aren't likely to rush into remote areas that are unprofitable. So, so how does the FCC uh, solve a challenge like that? We have a universal service fund to the tune of almost $9 billion a year that is invested all across this country, particularly in those rural areas where it's very expensive to serve. So we work with providers as a private-public partnership where we work with providers to bridge that gap because it is about money here. It is about, you know, having that margin that they need to be profitable. And we've got to recognize that. So we are proactively and for years have been doing that, um, investing in those communities that are very expensive to serve. And you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the Lifeline program. Mm-hmm. Right now, um, that is, I will, um, you know, be, um, you know, plain spoken here in need of an overhaul because we recognize uh, that what we said today, that it is essential for every American to be connected. A lot of people don't realize that today as we speak, there are five million individuals in this nation without any type of phone service, period. Five million people, too many. There are millions more who are barely hanging on, who are barely making it, and can barely afford to be connected. This is why Lifeline is so important. There are about 12 million people who are participating in this program and it's making a difference every day. It's making a difference in terms of them being able to find a job. It is making a difference for them keeping in touch with their um, children's school. It is making a difference with them in terms of health care. I cannot tell you the number of times I've spoken with health care professionals who say, I can tell when someone has maxed out their number of minutes because I don't hear from them at critical junctures in their health care delivery. We've got to reform Lifeline, a program that is vital, a program that is in need of a fix, that needs to have more dignity and competition and a, a more in-line, modern 
way of approaching uh, this uh, communications ecosystem and the needs of our communities. So well, we're going well, to do well, that yeah, to someone. Well, let me, uh, let me interrupt you here for just a moment uh, and, and, and ask you, because I've got to believe your job's getting very complicated right now. And here's the reason why. Because as much as I am in favor of a lifeline service for voice, if, you're, mm-hmm. if you do a lifeline service for the Internet, you don't need the voice component because you can do phone, you can do Skype over the Internet. So well, it, it kind of it, like we're, there's almost like a, uh, I, I don't know, do you have a sense or sort of a duplication going on? So I am looking at this like as a harmonization, I think is the better word. Because what we're, look at how you, you and I who are very fortunate um, how we communicate, how we use particularly our mobile phone. We use it in a multiplicity of ways. We don't necessarily right. spend a lot of time talking. We spend time texting as well as accessing over the Internet. Why should that experience be different for anyone regardless of income? That's and right, so but why not leapfrog at- voice? Why not leapfrog voice and go straight to Internet phone access, Internet Skype access, just go straight to the internet. Well, why are we why are we focused on voice? <laughs> we are, but we don't want to eliminate voice because when you're dialing nine one one, there needs to be you know a, a, a voice component to your experience. When you're gotcha. calling your child's um, you know your school, there needs to be a voice of, of capability um, to that device. So what we're saying is when we look at the Lifeline program. It's going to be structured differently, but the way in which we approach and think about Lifeline should not be out of sync with how we communicate each and every day. Yes. And so this is what we're talking about. In this particular program, we have a statutory obligation to ensure that those who are low income, those who have hit hard times, that they have affordable means of reasonably com- comparable service than you and I have. Mm-hmm. And this is what the purpose of Lifeline is, and it is time, this program is 30 years old, it is time for it to be modernized and be in sync with the digital age. I'm not contradicting what you're saying. What I'm saying is people experiences, particularly those who might be economically challenged, should be as dignified and robust and um, the same types of options as you and I have. Right, right. And I and I think we're saying the same thing, which is basically the Internet has changed everything. And so even the Lifeline program has got to take into account Internet access. I mean, they, they've got to, bl- as you to use your word, they've got to blend together. Uh, and, and if they don't, you know, one is just uh, going to be uh, irrelevant. Uh, so the, you, I have to believe the FCC's job is complicated these days because the Internet literally is moving into television, AM, FM, radio, the vo- voice infrastructure. You know, there's not an aspect Absolutely. that it's not touching. And when it touches it, it overlaps it. And, and, and then so that means every program you have has got to really be looked at now um, as a multifaceted program. And how does it uh, dovetail in with your Internet uh, programs? Now, I'm going to switch gears Ab- here for just, okay. just a moment because I want to talk about radio for a second. I know that this is a medium that is near and dear to your heart. And in, it's my uh, favorite medium. It, it is. It is. I was shocked. Absolutely. But, but I, no, but, you should not be. Oh, but, but it made me really happy. I said, wow, we got a friend in the, uh, we got a friend on the FCC. This is a good thing. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, but uh, you began in 2013 an AM uh, radio revitalization initiative. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what that program was and how is it working? Well, as you mentioned, in October of 2013, the FCC put out the ability for those to comment on some proposals that would afford relief for those broadcasters on the AM dial. Uh, And we recognize that um, there were some our unique challenges, particularly as it relates to, um, you know, this particular uh, platform that there are some signal, um, you know, issues that we need to um, call attention to, that there are some daytime, nighttime rule modifications that could be a little wonky here that need to come to terms with the the current experiences. So what we did was tee up uh, this particular um, proposal to seek comment 
on what direction we should head to better harmonize our rules for the current age. So you're going to see and hear a current uh, a common theme here because what we're doing with every particular portfolio, if you want to call it that, what we do at the FCC in terms of no matter what the platform is, is attempting to modernize and harmonize and to make sense for the current age. When we talk about the you know AM revitalization rule, this is no different. So this is something, as I said, that I teed up, and it is in um, the chairman's office. And um, I think, and I believe, in a not so distant future, uh, there will be some uh, you know relief for those um, in, in this uh, uh, you know in this particular medium. Now, uh, according to radio expert Eric Rhodes, um, two auto manufacturers have already announced plans to eliminate radios from their automobiles uh, in, in, in the next two years. And if this happens, uh, there goes half the audience for radio. So in your view, and I know you have affection for this medium, in, in your do. view, um, is there a place for radio in an Internet-driven world? I, I absolutely believe it. So when you think about I am from South Carolina and from what we call Hurricane Alley sometimes. Yeah. And if it weren't for AM radio, I don't know where we would be because um, WPAL AM was the only radio station that we could get for about 100 miles uh, during Hurricane Hugo. When it comes, it's particularly in terms of times of crisis, when it comes to getting information that is local, that serves the community, AM radio will always be a, a, a medium, that, uh, my medium of choice. Well, I think we, we all agree with you out here in California after the Loma Prieta quake. Uh, we couldn't get anything, cell phones, television, anything, except for the radio uh, off of our uh, automobiles. So uh, I, I hear you there. We have to take our final break. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and and drag-and-drop drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? Now, if you've been listening to the Costa Report, you know that I'm a big fan of wines by Caraccioli Cellars. And today I'm here with Scott Caraccioli, who's one of the brains behind the most memorable wines money can buy. So I have a question for you. How did your family get into the wine business? Um, You know, in 2006, my father, his brother and uncle were really playing with the idea of planting a vineyard. And planting a vineyard turned into making a bottle, turned into making sparkling wine when um, Michelle came into the picture so it was really kind of an organic situation us being in agriculture in the salinas valley and then the extension of that went to grapes and here we are today to find out more about caraccioli wines visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown carmel california that's caraccioli cellars c-a-r-a-c-c-i-o-l-i cellars where one bottle is never enough Hey, Patricia, I heard you were setting up a new home office. Yeah, Sam, I've been staring at this home office for dummies book for hours, and I still can't figure out the difference between a LAN and a WAN. We'll call user-friendly computing. They can help you set up an internal home network. But what about my wireless printer? What about it? They have all the answers to your network, workstation, or internet problems. They even provide outsourced IT for businesses big or small. 
User-friendly computing provides professional guidance to you for new computer purchases or network configurations. They also provide on-site professional support to your staff for everyday computer and network issues. User-friendly computing is locally owned at 505 River Street across from the Gateway Plaza. Or you can give them a call at 831-423-9653. That's 831-423-9653. Hi, this is Jim Bohannon, host of America in the Morning. Every morning from 5 till 6, our group of correspondents bring you breaking news from across America and around the world. So don't miss America in the Morning from 5 till 6 a.m. with the news you need to start your day. Then Rosie and the gang get you off to work with Good Morning Monterey Bay from 6 till 9 a.m. on KSCO AM 1080 Santa Cruz. It's always open house at the Mike Young Real Estate Hour, and you are always invited to walk right in and join the discussion. Hello, I am Mike Young, and I love talking real estate with all the experts and with you. So get a jump on the Real Estate Weekend every Friday, 7 p.m. on the Mike Young Real Estate Hour, right here on Listen and Be Heard Radio KSCO. The Mike Young Real Estate Hour is brought to you by Thunderbird Real Estate, Real People Selling Real Estate, by Rick Williams at American Pacific Mortgage, and by Steve Manville at Farmers Insurance. Friday at 7. See you then. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. Now, now I know one of your hot buttons has been to encourage more diversity in ownership of radio stations so that they'll be more diversity in programming. So tell us a little bit about that. Are, is, this, is the content on uh, AM radio too similar from station to station these days? Well, I, I won't comment on the content side of it, but the opportunity Ah, oh, go ahead. Ah, uh, <laughs> oh, go, go ahead. Why? <laughs> you're, you're allowed to have an opinion on content, not that the FCC will ever will ever weigh in on content because I know that's one of your um, one of your policies is not to do that unless of course it's profanity or pornography or something extreme well one of the things I've been a proponent of is diversity and ownership and points of view um, I always jokingly say that I want to hear and see persons with my southern drawl you know with your um, you know I don't know if you're a West Coast person but you know your accent and your point of view it's important I think it's important for the American fabric. And so what we've been attempting to do at the FCC is make it um, um, more, um, you know, ripe for investment and opportunities uh, for those um, who want to express themselves that way in order um, to have more news and information and points of view, um, you know, out in the public. And what you said earlier um, rings true. Um, what is important for me is, you know, opportunities on all platforms, because where we might not have an opportunity right now in terms of a radio um, ownership, there are opportunities that exist online that would have, uh, you know, radio or points of view on other platforms, like online platforms. And maybe we should talk more about how we can have those uh, you know, more of those synergies until we can afford maybe, um, you know, the station in which uh, um, you, you call home, um, you know, to be a part of our economic portfolio. So to me, it's about providing opportunities all along the chain, um, providing Internet um, for all, uh, for broadband, uh, you know, for all to make it more affordable uh, so that person with a good idea and a concept can, can, can share that. Um, and providing and sh- ensuring that we have the rules in place uh, for opportunities for those who want to go to the traditional route to buy stations. That's important to have opportunities. All of that, I hope, um, will continue to, to, uh, to fuel different points of view, and um, I know the American experience will be further enriched um, uh, by, those, uh, by those methods and, um, and, and opportunities. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I think there's too much similar programming, and that's part of what's hurt uh, AM radio in particular. I can't speak to a- FM radio, but uh, the talk radio stations, it's it's just, you know, you, you hear a different voice, but the same point of view day in and day out. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of haters and a lot of uh, folks that are, you know, just whipping up 
um, polarization in the country. And and the the good news is is that you know our syndication has been uh, spreading pretty rapidly. And I'm I'm a post partisan kind of person. I I really don't care about the left or right. I just want to fix problems. Um, but but that that shows me people are getting kind of tired of that steady diet. So I have you know I have great hope <laughs> for AM radio. I think if they start changing their content and they introduce a little more diversity of point of view, a little more cultural diversity as well. Uh, some of these stations now that are not doing well financially, maybe they, they need to um, be passed on, right, uh, to, and, and to what, and, and, different and what, points of view. Absolutely. And what I hope this revitalization um, uh, notice will bring is the opportunity for those to have common sense rules in place that will be enablers for those opportunities to make sure that it will fuel that that sound quality. Some people point to AM particularly that the sound quality is not quite there. There are some technologies that we hope to be, um, you know, helping to further facilitate that will make that sound equalization a reality. And AM right now is a, a, a more ex, less expensive. Um, pathway to ownership, and all of these things, I think, will you know work together to 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 help with that type of diversity of of, of ownership and points of view, and um, and you and I are on the same page. I will uh, gladly say to you, um, from an opinion point of view, that you and I are on the same page as it relates to that. Ab- absolutely, and you know, as you point out, people can start a show or a program on internet radio. Uh, very inexpensively uh, and very accessibly. They can, you know, they can put a podcast up. They can uh, go out on YouTube and upload. Um, These, you know, the cost of being able to do that is really coming down to the cost of owning a cell phone, right, and buying cell phone service. Now, I don't want to act like everybody can do that because, you know, that's not true. People can't. Some people can't afford a cell phone or cell phone service right now. But but it's gotten, it keeps coming down. And that's what gives me great hope that the diversity of content, you go on YouTube now and you can find anything. Right. Um, and we didn't have that before. So I love that that the Internet has opened up opportunity. And I believe and I have been pro net neutrality from day one. And I get believe me, I'm here in Silicon Valley, so I get a lot of heat for this. But I'm going to say that when you've got something that has opened up opportunity like like the Internet has, you have to protect that. You, you have to protect and I, it. And I believe the FCC did the right thing in this case. And I appreciate that, and I agree with you that the, this is the vehicle for opportunity, and not only for opportunity, um, you know, in the in, in the new sense, but in the legacy sense. And what I mean by that is, I can't tell you the number of people, particularly with a a, a playwright um, a, 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 that I met named Issa Rae from the West Coast, um, who produced her own show online, and now she's getting picked up by HBO. And, and so this is what I mean about having these different platforms because the sky is literally the limit in terms of where it leads to next, in terms of opportunities on legacy platforms as well as um, you know, these um, new technological and not seen yet um, uh, you know, platforms that um, we're waiting to, uh, to take part in. So it, it, it's, it's incredible, and um, I, I am with you that I – know we did the right thing in terms of um, our open Internet decision. We will defend it, um, you know, uh, when it's uh, time to do so. And um, the courts, um, you know, put a schedule uh, in place. And uh, uh, we are looking forward um, to continue to realize uh, the benefits of an open and robust platform. Freedom of speech. Absolutely. Freedom of opportunity. I think you're absolutely right that it's going to be interesting as the service providers begin to challenge that. Um, they're, they've got deep pockets. They've got smart, smart lawyers. Uh, it'll be very interesting to watch the case as it moves forward. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we've got left. But before we say goodbye, I, I do want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Ms. Cliburn, for taking time to be with us today. It has been my pleasure to join you. If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or comment to make about our interview with Mignon Clyburn, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm all over the Internet. (laughs) 
<laughs> and if you missed the full interview with Miss Clyburn today or any of our other previous guests, remember you can download episodes of the Costa Report from our website at RebeccaCosta.com and also Apple iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube. And don't forget, you'll also find our weekly radio blog at RebeccaCosta.com. The web address is easy to remember, folks. It's, it's my name.com. <laughs> What's terrific about that blog is that it, it captures what a guest had to say in a few short paragraphs. So if you ever have to miss a program, you can still stay in the know by going to RebeccaCosta.com and grabbing the blog. And before we wind up the first hour here, let me take a moment to thank listeners who have ordered their autographed copy of The Watchman's Rattle from our Internet site. A, a number of you have ordered the book as a graduation gift. And, and that is about the highest compliment you can pay us because uh, in the next few weeks, the future of our country and the world are graduating. And the Watchman's Rattle offers those graduates an opportunity to approach our problems very differently than we have in the past. And, and in doing so, avoid the gridlock and instability and consternation that we're now facing. So if you know a young person who's graduating and who wants to make a difference in the world, please Take a moment to order a copy of the Watchman's Rattle for them with a custom dedication inside from me. Uh, You'll be doing two good turns, actually, because 100% of the proceeds from book sales go toward keeping interviews like the one you heard today on the air. The Costa Report is self-supporting and beholden to no special interest group, no sponsor company, no big network, no individual. It allows us to remain entirely independent and bring you the kind of unbiased, in-depth reporting that uh, you used to be able to count on the media to deliver. My guest next week is the CEO of Aeromobile, Yuri Vakulik, who plans on introducing the first flying car in the next 24 months. Are we ready for a flying car? Find out when Yuri Vakulik joins us next week on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for the second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. <music> 